Welcome to my video series, Essential Extract Vector Calculus. The goal of this series is to give a comprehensive overview of all of the main topics that you would encounter in a typical course on vector calculus. By the end of these videos, I'm going to cover all of the topics listed here. You can think of this as an executive summary or a top-level review of the subject. I will do a few examples and even explain the proofs of some theorems, and I'll aim to present everything in a way that's complete and clear enough for you to remember. However, I'm not going to stop for very long on any one topic. The presentation is going to be mostly self-contained, but I am going to have to assume that you've taken differential and integral calculus, and also that you're familiar with partial derivatives and multiple integrals. That will allow me to give a broad overview of all of these topics, probably in less than one hour. We'll see if that claim holds up in the end, but that's what I'm shooting for. In addition, I've prepared a one-sheet handout which summarizes most of the topics we're going to be covering in concise form. There's a link to this handout in the video description. You can also print it out if you want and make some notes as we go. I'm hoping that by the end of these videos you will have a solid understanding of everything on the handout and that you'll know how to use these tools to solve all kinds of problems in other parts of mathematics and the sciences. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. In this first video, I'm going to introduce the notation and basic definitions that I'll be using throughout the series. This is kind of important, but it's also pretty straightforward, so I'll try to keep this video relatively short. If you've seen this stuff before and you feel confident that you can figure out my notation on the fly, you can go ahead and try and skip to the second video. If you have any questions about notation or things like that, you can always come back to this one later. First of all, let me go over the notation that I'm going to be using in all of these videos. If I write blackboard n, I mean the set of positive integers. This is also called the set of natural numbers, and I just have to say this to avoid any ambiguity for people who might define this in another way. Next, if little n is a natural number and I write rn, I mean the set of ordered n-tuples of numbers x1 to xn where each of the xi's is a real number. Of course, this is just what we would call n-dimensional Euclidean space. If I write v sub n, I also mean the set of ordered n-tuples x1 to xn, but here I'm thinking of these n-tuples as vectors in Euclidean space. So they come along with a natural notion of addition and scalar multiplication. The difference between Rn and Vn is really subtle, and a lot of times we go back and forth between thinking of points in Rn and vectors in Vn, or vice versa. If and when it's necessary to emphasize the additional vector structure in Vn, we'll use triangular brackets instead of parentheses. Really quickly, I'll mention a few more items of basic notation and convention. First of all, in the context we're working in, the set of real numbers is called the field of scalars. Secondly, when I'm working with a vector x in Vn, I'll use an arrowhead over it to emphasize the fact that it's a vector. One exception to this is on the vector calculus handout in the description. There I use boldface instead of arrowheads to denote vectors and vector functions and vector fields. The reason for that is purely typographical. Hopefully it doesn't cause any confusion. The real numbers x1 to xn that make up the vector x are called the components of the vector. When we're working in Vn, every vector can be written as a linear combination of the vectors e1 to en that I've indicated here. ei is the vector with all zeros except for a 1 in the ith place, and of course these are what we call the standard basis vectors in Vn. Finally, as I mentioned a minute ago, we often go back and forth between thinking about points in Rn and thinking of them as vectors in Vn. In case anybody has forgotten, I'd like to also remind you of the definitions of the dot and cross products. Let's suppose that we have two vectors x and y in Vn with components x1 to xn and y1 to yn. The dot product of these two vectors is what you get by taking x1 times y1 plus x2 times y2 plus dot 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 xn times yn. The notation for the dot product of two vectors is just to put a dot between them. Notice that the output of the dot product of two vectors is always a scalar. If we're working in three dimensions, we can also define the cross product of x and y. When n is 3, the cross product of the vectors x and y is defined to be the vector in v3 whose components are given by the formula here at the bottom. In case you have a hard time remembering this formula, there's a nice little mnemonic. The cross product can also be computed by taking the determinant of the 3 by 3 matrix, whose first row consists of the three standard basis vectors, and second and third rows consist of the components of x, followed by the components of y. It's important to remember that if you switch the roles of x and y, you'll get the negative of what's written at the bottom here. In other words, the order matters. If you compute y cross x, you'll get the negative of x cross y. Finally, let's talk about the objects that we're planning to study. In single variable calculus, we studied functions whose domain and codomain were both the set of real numbers. We were interested in questions about the rate of change of such functions, i.e. differentiation, and the cumulative value of such functions over intervals, i.e. integration. In multivariable calculus, we extended these kind of considerations to real-valued functions whose domains are Rn for any integer n bigger than or equal to 1. 
Now, in vector calculus, we broaden the scope even more. We still study functions from Rn to R, but in the context of vector calculus, we call these functions scalar fields. Now, we're also interested in studying vector-valued functions from Rn to Vm, where n and m here are both allowed to be positive integers. We're going to refer to such functions as vector functions. In the special case when m is equal to n, so that we actually have a function from Rn to Vn, vector functions are often referred to as vector fields. You can think of a vector field as attaching a vector in n-dimensional Euclidean space to every point in Euclidean space. This is especially useful when you're trying to understand problems in physics, where the magnitude and direction of a force acting on each point in space can be encoded as a vector. We'll see some examples like this later on. Note that I put an arrowhead over the vector functions and vector fields to remind you that the output here is a vector. Once again, on the vector calculus handout, there's no arrowhead, but vector functions and vector fields are denoted in boldface. That's the end of the first video in this series. Thanks for watching. In the next video, we're going to introduce the differential operators grad div and curl, and we're going to take a look at some pretty interesting examples and theorems.